Hello, welcome back to Lyric Hi-Fi in March 2021. You may have seen me just a few seconds ago in this shirt. Pretend it's another day. Um, I'm just wearing the same shirt. So we talked briefly about Lynn Organic and now we're going to do History of Lynn because we've got all this gear here. So this is the, the History of Lynn right in front of us. Now it's not every product, but it's quite, quite a few of them. So um, let's start at the beginning. The turntable. The Lynn Sondek LP12, one of the most famous turntables in the market, now in continuous production for over 45 years. Um, this is an original one from the late 1970s. Every part of this is now different, and yet overall it looks about the same and about the same size. Um, and some people say a new one looks old fashioned, but I think it looks classic. There's, there's one behind me on the wall, you can maybe see there, which is a, a new one. Looks just the same, different colour, but it looks just the same. The story of the Lynn, okay, I'm going to tell this story then. The, the story of, of this is that uh, Lynn was started by a guy called Ivor Tiefenbrunn. Um, he's a very interesting chap. He's uh, got lots of opinions and he's a really clear thinker. And whenever he got married, he got sent out by his wife to buy something like a washing machine or something like that. And he came back that same day with no washing machine, but a hi-fi system. Wouldn't you like to do that? That's fantastic. So he gets home, puts the hi-fi system together, listens to it for a couple of days and says, oh, this isn't very good, I need something better. So he goes back to the shop and they say, oh, you need bigger speakers. So he brought back his speakers and they gave him bigger speakers and he gave them more money. Uh, Evelyn, his wife, now is washing everything by hand. That's okay. He's got bigger speakers and he puts them on after a couple of days thinks, yeah, it's sort of there's more bass, but, you know, not really a big difference. So uh, he goes back to the shop again. They says, this isn't any better. And they say, oh, you must be deaf. Um, what you need is a bigger amplifier, because maybe these bigger speakers need more power. So they give him a more powerful amplifier. And he went straight back with it and said, that's worse. This is actually getting worse. What's going on? So um, he couldn't really work this out. And then he thought about it logically. At the time, the wisdom was the only thing made a big difference was actually speakers, because you made them bigger and there's more bass. But he actually thought about this and thought, the speakers are only as good as the signal you feed into them from the amplifier. And the amplifier, surely, can only get all the information through it if you get the information off the record. So if the turntable loses information, you can't get it back elsewhere. So it becomes evident that the turntable or the source, shall we say, is the most important part of a system. Now, obviously you want a balance in the system, but if you don't get the information out of the groove, the rest of it's lost. This is now accepted as very straightforward, but in the 1970s, this was absolutely revolutionary and everybody thought he was a nutcase. That's a different story. Anyway. One way he was very lucky was his father owned a company called Castle Engineering that made uh, high quality engineering parts for automotive and um, uh, aircraft industries. And so he had the ability to actually make his own turntable. And very few people have that. People look at Lynn Sondex and go, oh, look at the machining on that. It's all made from solid and things like that. But, you know, if I decide to make a turntable, I couldn't make that up in my garage. That's why lots of people who get into making turntables have to use materials that are off the shelf and they use all kinds of cheap plastics and different things. Anyway, Ivor was very lucky he could do this. And this center part of this is actually very important. The center bearing, which is like little else. Here, I have one that I prepared before. And this is the center part of this. Now this part is an alloy around the outside, but this spindle and the thrust plate it sits on are made of hardened tool steel. Now that is so hard that you can't cut that with a lathe the way you can cut the softer platter parts with a lathe. So it has to be ground. So it is ground by a finish over and over again. This one at this profile and then the thrust pad goes onto this. And the tolerance of this is plus or minus a tenth of a thousandth of an inch. It's pretty small. It's about a tenth of the size of a, no, hundredth the size of a human hair, something like that. Having the ability to make this in your dad's playground 
of a business is just an incredible advantage. And he started making these things. There's a few stories about him going away and coming back and all this kind of stuff. But basically, Lynn Hi-Fi was born. And people say, well, where does Lynn Hi-Fi come from? Well, um, Castle Engineering, which was his father's business, uh, Ivor started his business next door. Uh, and that was in Castle Milk in Glasgow, which is a fairly interesting part of Glasgow. If you want to Google Castle Milk, at one stage it was uh, pretty much the largest sort of deprived area of uh, social housing in Western Europe where they knocked down all the inner city tenement blocks that are really nice and shifted everybody out here. Um, and opposite the road that this was on was a park called Lynn Park. And so Ivor called his business Lynn Products. Seems very obvious, really, although lots of people went, oh, Lynn, that must be Scandinavian. No, it's from the south side of Glasgow. So Ivor started making these, and um, magazines started to take notice that this crazy man was letting them hear the difference in turntables. He was insisting that people went, you know, listen to whatever turntable you want to and listen to mine. Mine will sound better. And people were going, oh my God, yes, it does. So uh, Lynn Products started and started to grow fairly quickly through the late 70s. And at that time, Ivor then turned his uh, thoughts to the other end of the system and the speakers, which is why this is sitting here. Uh, this is called a Lynn Sara. But the first speaker they made was called Lynn Isobaric. And that was uh, in order to get a bigger bass performance out of a certain size of cabinet. There were two bass units, one on the front, one behind. So they played like this. So as a bass unit moves forward, pushes air, and has to move back and do work against the air in the cabinet, in a sealed cabinet. But if you get two of them, and they're getting the same signal, then there is no back pressure. So isobaric, from isobar, a line on a weather map of equal pressure. So the pressure doesn't change. So this, the full isobaric were too huge to fit in this table. The Sara was the bookshelf version. And the Sara of this uses the same treble unit as they did in this, which was uh, made uh, by a Scandinavian company originally called Scanspeak, then later another one called Heikifon. The bass units were made by Kef, but they were modified for Lin. And this bass unit, as it moves in and out, has another bass unit in behind it. So these things weigh an absolute ton. And they were quite expensive for a small speaker back in the day. I remember selling these for six or seven hundred pounds in the 1980s, which was a huge chunk of money. But it was, again, a, a groundbreaking system. And Lynn spent a lot of money tooling up for this plastic molding that held the two bass units stiffly so we could do that. They then had a little tiny speaker called Can and said, why is it called Can? Well, because Lynn can make a small speaker, so we'll call it a Can. Uh, I thought I would have won it here today, but couldn't find a broken one anywhere. I've got a pair at home, I could have brought one in. But anyway, um, so they got into speakers as well. Then later, in most of, most of the time, I should say at that time, Lynn systems were sold along with name amplifiers. Really nice, uh, good amplifiers made in England, and we still sell name amplifiers. But Lynn had an idea about doing something better. And that was moving away from mechanical parts, moving away from switches and knobs and volume controls or pieces of plastic uh, rubbing together, which would wear out and would introduce distortions and noise and all kinds of things. And they wanted something that was completely silent. And uh, a very clever engineer called Bill Miller used a thing called a ladder resistor array in order to have uh, discrete steps of Mm, not sure how many, 256 discrete steps of volume um, to have no noise and to have something that would also last a lifetime without deteriorating. He also had some ideas about power amplification and how that would work. So in the late 80s, uh, Lynn started with an amplifier called the LK1 and the LK2. The LK1 is this. This was the first ever pre-amplifier, first over electronic component made by Lynn. Most of them still work. Some of them don't. Uh, some of them um, we have people even using still as phono stages because the quality of the phono stage in this was just exceptional. You would really not be surprised that because the output of this part is very, very tiny and Lynn wanted to preserve that, that they would pay special attention to this. And so this went through different iterations and came to things like the Lynn Cairn which was a fine, fine pre-amplifier for many years. And underneath this was the Clout. Now, the Clout is a power amplifier. 
uh, of uh, all machined from one piece and it's a beautiful piece of engineering and still very desirable today and still selling online for uh, far more than you would think. They were about £2,000 new, uh, probably in the late 80s or early 90s, early 90s. And if you bought most Japanese hi-fi in the early 90s, it would now be worth threepence halfpenny. But uh, these are still selling online from anywhere from 700 to 1,000 pounds. So very, very uh, interesting piece of gear. Um, about this time where Lynn was starting into this, they were still working on turntables. So they had better arms, better power supply for the turntable, control of the motor, making motors quieter and vibrating less. Um, all these kinds of things they were working on. And at a certain stage, when CD came in, they were still working away on turntables. Obviously, they still are today. Um, but the next stage to take this on, they wanted to learn more about what they were playing. They wanted to learn more about records. So they thought, tell you what, let's start a record company. And this came out of the fact that a few places in England who were cutting records were closing down, farming that out, because records were getting cheaper and they had to cut down the quality. And so Lynn bought a thing called a Scully lathe, still recognized as the most accurate cutting lathe in, uh, in the world. And so they refurbished this and a cutting lathe is the opposite of a record player. It's where you put on a blank piece of lacquered plastic and you put on a head the sound from the tape, we're still talking master tapes, analog master tapes goes into that, and that cuts out the groove and puts the signal onto the groove. So Lynn could understand the master tape quality, the lacquer quality, playing it back on an acetate, where the losses were in the stampers, and where you end up the whole way through to the record, which you put on the turntable, and then you compare and you understand the entire engineering process. This is something that Lynn Records is still going today as a division where they do their own recordings, mostly classical, some jazz and vocal. They're a small label, but they still do the highest quality of recordings. They really are uh, superb. And um, this I lifted today from my collection to show you, because this is a band from Glasgow called the Blue Nile who are still about today, and they were signed to Lynn Records, and uh, they were a very unusual band because they produced this work that, like most bands, is the, the first album, it is something that they've actually been working on for years and years, and um, these weren't guys of 19 years of age, they were guys, I suppose, in their late 20s, early 30s, but they knew what they wanted. This is called a walk across the rooftops, recommend it, still play it now and again. Um, but whenever you, uh, w whenever they signed up for this, um, it actually gained a little bit of traction, a bit of airplay, so Virgin Records came along. So uh, Lynn talked to Virgin Records and they were do, wanting a distribution deal. So Lynn insisted that the guys in the band held the copyright to their own music, which was pretty good because a few years later, whenever they needed some money, they sold the rights to this album for 400,000. But the album at that time uh, they, Virgin wanted the rights, they wouldn't give it to them. But Virgin distributed this, and after about six or eight months of doing really well, Virgin went, right, where's the next album, boys? And they were like, it took us three years to do the last one. I mean, we haven't even started on it. We're still touring and promoting this. No, 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 you need an album out now. And that was a great lesson about the record business, because the record business isn't about music. It's about the record business, selling records. Anyway. That's a bit of a digression, except it was very important for Lynn to learn about that. Remember where I started that? To actually understand and improve the turntable. So they got into records, um, they got into amplifiers, and then CD was grin and grind, but Lynn were never going to do anything in CD players, which was going to be a me too situation. Most British manufacturers, how they get onto it was buying a mechanism from Philips, and buying usually a chipset from Philips and sticking a bigger power supply on it and a different finish or whatever. The amount of genuine research was fairly limited, but research was what Lynn did and what they financed and what they invested in. So they came up with this. This is the Lynn Carrick. This is their first CD player, which again goes back to early 90s probably. Um, the first thing that people would notice about this is this tray is not a piece of cheap plastic. 
This tray is machined from solid, sitting on a, a rail system that is really beautifully engineered. Now, don't try this at home because if you lift this up by that, most of your CD players will break. This is just a piece of art. It's absolutely fantastic. There was the Carrick, Carrick version 123, followed by an Akimi, followed by a thing called a CD12. Note, CD12, LP12. It was the top they could do. Going back in the day, it was like three and a half thousand pounds, which was mental money. You could buy a decent car for that. Um, so uh, their engineering brought them into that, this digital world. They also did their own digital to analog converter in terms of the work they did in that for the power supplies and things like that. And uh, CDs became a large part of the business, but they still sold turntables, they still sold uh, speakers. They improved the digital system with different DACs that they used in different generations and learned more about power supplies. And the range of amplifiers became larger, as well as Cairn. There was a magic level below that. And then uh, they went and they had a, a, a level called Climax and Accurate. So you had magic and then accurate and then climax. The climax was uh, seen as their highest possible level and all the components just could not have been better made. This is a Climax DSM, which is a streamer in a Climax box. They also have power amplifiers in that case, which apart from looking beautiful and weighing a ton, they sound amazing, but they also cost lots of money because that is machined from solid, that's proper engineering. Whenever you look at Lynn taking their amplifiers and CD players forward as well, this thing about being able to control their own destiny, they were now having their own drive units made, they're machining all of this. They wanted to be able to control their own destiny in electronics as well. And so they decided to bring population of boards in-house and everything then they could do and control within themselves. So this board is actually out of a preamplifier, but this is a masterpiece of precision work. The board comes into the factory, the components come into the factory, and they're populated in-house. Very few manufacturers, specialist manufacturers can do this. They always farm this out to a bigger company, but to be able to have all your own testing and all your own quality control at the highest level is something just other manufacturers, even if they're making expensive gear, they do not invest in this level of detail. And it's one of the things that gives Lynn a big advantage, especially when you come on to the things they were able to do with that, because they were also into active systems. If any of you understand what an active system is, the signal is split up into treble and mid-range and bass before it gets fed to the loudspeaker. There's a separate um, uh, crossover for each one and then a separate power amplifier for each one. So they had been doing this from an early age, but they wanted to move this further. So the sequence that happened here to move this further was first of all, digital went to streaming. And the streaming meant that instead of you putting a disc on that got thrown information at a DAC and the DAC had to sort out the timing and get this done, streaming was started at very low quality with things like Spotify and things like that. But Lynn recognized that if they worked on this, you could have a much higher quality system. So you had the storage of the gear, oh, sorry, of the information, the music on a hard drive. Now, of course, all on the web, but you still have storage systems on a hard drive, but the streamer is in control. So it looks at that information, has its own buffering, and pulls the information and it's in control. And that means that it can totally eliminate jitter and you can get a lot more dynamics from a properly constructed streaming system. So Lynn, when they started to do this, completely just said, right, this is better than our CDs. Why would you want a CD player? Let's discontinue the CDs and we'll do streaming. So they went 100% streaming and we're the first company in the world, just whenever CDs were still big, to say, that's it, we're not making those anymore. They're over, let's move on. So streaming, then started another journey because there were ways to improve this with DACs and with power supplies and things like that. But also moving on and going back to the active system, if you think about it now, Lynn have got their record company. They're making a 24-bit, 192 sampling kilohertz uh, signal and they're able to stream that 
into your house at studio master quality and the same resolution as they're using at a master tape. So whenever that comes in and that hits your streaming system, they then want to be able to get the most information out of that. But they've done all the work at the studio end. They know what they're doing with all this stuff. Streaming into your house, you've got a near perfect situation. And then you go through the digital analog converter into the analog stages of the amplifier and analog stages to the amplifier. They thought, hmm, how can we take this a wee bit further? So what they decided to do is in the digital domain, they would split up the bass, middle, and treble. A two-way loudspeaker would be just mid-range bass and treble. A three-way loudspeaker, like a lot of them, you would split into three different sit situations, three different segments in the digital domain. Of course, the problem with this now is that if it's a stereo system and you've got a stereo digital analog converter, one for each channel, and you've got a three-way speaker, you now need six digital analog converters, and you now need six power amplifiers. So while technically anybody would go, wow, this is a brilliant thing to do, well, you just made your system a lot more expensive. So you end up with things like this. What's this mechanical here, you say? It's got speaker terminals on the back, but hey, there are no inputs in this. What's going on here? So this actually takes a digital signal from your streamer in a thing called an exact format. And in that exact format, it then splits up the digital signal in the digital domain. And you can have up to four different groups, four different banks in this. And then because you've split that up into four different groups of, of, uh, of frequencies, you now need eight digital analog converters in one box. And then, ooh, we've got to amplify those. Eight sets of power amplifiers all in one box. This is called an accurate exact box I, and it can be a large part of the system for many people. There are higher level systems at Climax. This would be several different boxes because the top level has like mono power amplifiers. So you would have eight boxes for the power amplifiers, another two boxes for the digital analog converters. But at the accurate level, the work that's in this, the amount of design time in this, the precision of manufacturing is just something that most manufacturers simply couldn't do. They don't have the resource and they don't have the manufacturing capability. So we've gone through all of this. Lynn also then, just a few years ago, introduced Select, which is a level that they have for an integrated system. The Magic Integrated Streamer and Amplifier uh, was around about uh, latest version about £2,950. This one goes from about £5,000 up to about £9,000, depending on different specs and what you want. Beautifully made front panel, nice big volume knob. Who doesn't like a big volume knob? And um, then uh, that was with Catalyst DAX, which is their highest quality, until the video last week, where they came up with a thing called Organic. And Organic is the next level, and Organic might even be the next video, although we've got other stuff to do. But that is a brief history of Lynn. Have I left anything out? I think I've talked long enough. I think, I think I need a glass of wine. So thank you very much indeed for watching and putting up with all that. Please subscribe if you want to hear more. And um, the next video hopefully will be warmer because it'll be after Easter. Stay safe. Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for watching.